All right, guys, we'll get cooking in a minute. See if anybody actually decides to show up a little bit early. Canna Williams decided to show up first. Right. Hey, Canna, how are you doing? We will get rolling in just a minute. So the question of the, the, the icebreaker question of the day, Doug, is this. First of all, where are you from? And secondly, where is your favorite place to vacation or where are you going this year? Um, we just got back from being out west at Yellowstone, which apparently we, we avoided the bears. We avoided the buffalo. We are still alive. All right. So where, well, that's so an accomplishment. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. Given given the news, right? Every every other day, there's somebody getting gored or getting getting racked by a bear. Anyway, where are you from, and where where's your favorite place to vacation, or where are you going this year? Is we like I said, we just got back from. I'm gonna pop this in. So you go down to the chat. Hold on a second. I'm gonna go to the chat. I'm gonna say from Woodstock, Merlin. And my favorite place to go though is is really um i got two places i'll just put the one that i'm going to go to next florida keys that's where i like to go anyway based out of dc and outer banks love it lacy appreciate that Very so how about cool. you doug where what do you like to do where do you do oh we go to costa rica every year well we lottie da to you yeah we don't go to the and we don't go well so like some people go to florida every year and we just we just we go to florida and we take one more flight. One more flight. How far is it? How far is Costa Rica? Yeah, two and a half hours flight from Miami. That's not too bad. Something like that. Yeah. It's about a about a two and a half hour drive from Miami to Key West. Mm -hmm. There you so go. It's about that. So where are you from? And where's your favorite place to vacation? Or where are you going this year? Whatever it is you'd like to do. Uh, we'll get started in just a minute with the hybridization of everything. We'll let a couple of other people pop in here. I think we have like 45, 45, 50 people that are wound up registering. We know some of the folks just wait until they get the recording because it is being recorded. Ah, hold on a second. Let me see. Hey, Matt. Good morning, man. You have your link. All right. But, um, that's Matt, in case you didn't know. Matt, Matt Sweet. He's mm -hmm. with Divine. Hold on one second. I'll make sure you get it while uh and because we're on live, I'll, I'll get it to you. All right, see you. All right, bye. All right, let me make sure you get that. In the meantime, where are you from? And we'll get the, let me pop this up so everybody knows we're not just talking about travel here. We're actually be talking about the case for adaptive archi enterprise architecture, but it's really about everything being hybrid, hi, hi, hybridized. That's my new term, the being hybridized. So, and where are you out of, Doug? I'm in the Chicago area, Hoffman Estates. Well, our office is in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. I'm in the northwest suburbs of Chicago area. Originally from Manhattan. From Manhattan? Whereabouts? What, what part of Manhattan? Upper West Side, Columbia mm -hmm. University area. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm 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 stalling for time, so I make sure I get Matt's um. So I, I, but I'm in Chicago long enough to become a to become a Cubs fan, but not long enough to stop being a Yankees fan. Ah, well, <laughs> you can do both. Those aren't those aren't the rivals, right? Right. Yeah, they're not direct rivals. Yeah, we can we can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> I'm a hybrid baseball fan. <laughs> hybrid, hybrid. There you go, man. It, that was a nice little weave in you got there. Hybrid fa baseball fan. All right, Lucy's in Austin, Texas. Hey, triple digits since noon. Hey, you live in Austin. <laughs> Favorite place to visit? Taiwan. I've never been there, Lu Lucy. That sounds like a great place to go. So the question is, the icebreaker question of the day is, where are you from and where's your favorite case place to vacation? And we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm hoping Matt can ap actually get here. I shot him, I reshot him that. Hopefully that works. So we want to welcome everybody to this uh, presentation. We have a bunch of folks that are interested in this. I, I find that fascinating, Doug. There's a lot of hybridization that's happening in the government, and we're going to talk about that. And for those of you that are here, this is the disclaimer that GSA gives us for you so that you can participate. So it's not endorsed by 
uh, GSA or anything like that. And your participation is not an endorsement either so that we can have the conversations here on GovBrief. If you would like to, um, to, to engage with us, we love that, don't we, Doug? We do, yes. yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, we love that. And um, hang on, Matt, you're coming in. I'm, I'll make sure you can yeah, share. We, we, we love doing too. webinars, but we like real, honest to goodness, face-to-face, -face, heart to heart conversations even more. Isn't that nice? Yeah, and we're getting we're getting closer <laughs> to that, I think. But if you'd like to participate, uh, you can raise your hand, you can pop into the q and I'll, I'll make sure I, I take a look at the chat as well. And if it's something that you don't want everybody else and the mother to say, send it to matt.sweet at divine.com. So that, that way you get to you. So you're, here we go. Watch this. Watch this, Doug. Best briefing ever from Barb from Education says adaptive is explained. I think we can probably help with that. Uh, James from HHS, the speaker, that would be you, Doug, doesn't talk over our heads. Okay. There you go. Uh, Bruce, best briefing ever if you just learned one thing new. And mm -hmm. Cecilia, the concept of fusion teams were included. Wow, that's an interesting one. Mustafa, great name from ACF. I can finally learn how to get support I needed during the significant transition during the pandemic. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that for you, mm -hmm. Mustafa, but we will be talking about we'll be talking about hybridization and maybe that'll weave into what you need. Uh, Catherine from NRC, it provides concise, knowledgeable information. I hope that is true. Uh, Jamie from USDA received information that will benefit the office and division I work in. That's the whole idea, right, Doug? Yep, absolutely. And Derek, there are slide decks to review at a later date. Watch this, Derek. Hold on one second. I got something for you right now. And everybody else, we can download the presentation. I'll do my best to keep that popping that in there for people to come in late. Uh, so I got that. And if Zoom works, that's for Teresa. It's the best briefing ever if Zoom just worked. I'm not sure if Teresa's here or not, but we'll see. All right, so here's what they we want to address. Leticia, what does hybridization architecture look like in the federal workspace? I do believe that is the topic of discussion, right, Doug? Yeah, something like that, yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and now Re Re Reynolds asking, how might AI be used in the VA? Is that part of hybridization? Is AI in that too, or are we going to push that to something else? Well, we mentioned it, but we don't spend a lot of time on AI in this one. So, Reynolds, we might have to take that one offline. Mm -hmm. uh, Catherine. So we have people, yeah, we have people who can talk to that. That's for sure. Uh, can a case for in-person presence in office be made justified post-pandemic? Great question. Mm. Uh, Bruce. Uh, enterprise software is cloud service for radiation oncology. No idea what that is, Bruce. Uh, we'll we'll see what we can do to address that very specific question later. Uh, Char Lamar, how to work effectively in hybrid environments and what is the future of hybrid work? I love that. That's a great one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So now we're going to yeah. ask. And I would say these these are great questions. I'd, and I'd say most of them could be a whole webinar by themselves. That's in I, I, I believe so. So why are you here? Are you in the hot seat for a hybrid project? Are you trying to get your head about hybrid technology? I'm trying to get my head around a hybrid work, workplace. Um, I want to be part of a hybrid dialogue or your boss made you come. You can be honest with that. We got Weisenheimers all over the place, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we got a bunch of folks that are coming back. We appreciate you guys joining us and continuing the conversation because that's what it's all about. Hey, Matt Sweet, how you doing there, big man? Doing great, Dave. How are you? Doing all right. So tell us a little bit about Divine. This is Matt Sweet. He handles uh, business development with Divine. So tell us what, what in the world you do there. Absolutely. So I am the director of federal solutions on that one. So uh, we've been in business for 20 years. We're an 8A certified firm. Um, and, uh, we have contracts with the department of educate, well, uh, energy and SSA and tons of commercial work, uh, again, in business for 20 years. So we're not a fly by night firm, but we did just get our eight a in 21. So, uh, awesome. we have that until 30. So, so 2021, yeah, you get an extra year, don't you? For being COVID was That's, that part of that? It was. So we're yeah. good to 2030. Awesome. And you also have a GSA contract, I think, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And we're working now on Oasis Plus. So it's a big endeavor. So, oh boy, that's all. That's going to be fun. That's a Absolutely. fun one. And I just want right, to thank well, everyone for their time and, and for coming. So, oh, you better believe it, man. It's great. And so uh, I'm going to end that poll. I'm going to start another one right away because we're going to be talking about hybridization throughout this whole thing. Let's, let's share this real quick. 
for everybody. So nobody's on the hot seat. A lot of people trying to get their head around it. And and then uh, folks have been here before. It's great. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much for that. And I got to go back and close that out. I often do that. So, all right, here we go. So the next one is, what is going on in your agency? So we have a lot of different agencies that are here and a lot of more that are going to be watching this later. I've talked to a couple of people myself. So hybrid IT architecture, hybrid work environment, and hybrid processes. And we're going to talk about all those, aren't we, Mr. Doug? We are. Mm -hmm. All right. So let me see if I can do this without a, a warp in the time-space continuum. Boom. <laughs> let's, let's see. All right. So let's let's get right into it. Of what, what what what's what's on your mind today about what we want to talk about? Can you see the screen? Yep. Does it work? All right, cool. Yeah, you're still running the poll? Yeah, we're on the poll, but you got your topics too. Your okay, topic. yeah. Yeah, so after a couple of introductory points, we're going to just uh, take a step back and look at the, the federal initiatives or the federal computing strategies over the last uh, dozen or so years. And what do we mean by hybrid everything? What does that really mean? And, and it's a, kind of a bold claim but we'll, we'll see why that's really true. We'll talk about uh, agency challenges and, and really what you're up against and, and uh, try <clears throat> in uh, adapting uh, various technologies in this hybrid world to serve the serve the public and get things done. Uh, and, and what that means uh, in terms of being a dynamic organization, a dynamic uh, agency and uh, we have some case studies at the end if we get that far, but they will be in the deck that we share. And uh, we'll talk about uh, you know maybe what comes next. That's fantastic. So, and you you started to talk about this several months ago, the hybridization of everything, because it's not just one way or another now, it's it's kind of mixing everything together. Isn't that right? Yeah, and this really is, it's, 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 um, it's, it's not at all a new idea, this, this, Quote this article I came across was over 30 years ago uh, from uh, it was in Fast Company magazine when it was a brand new magazine. They talked about the in older organizations the organizing principle was discrete everything. You know, this this these people did function A and these people did function B and they never talked to each other and they never worked together. <clears throat> but these days uh, it's more about uh, interdepartmental, interagency, cross-functional, integrated systems, sharing information, being collaborative. And so it's uh, even the people themselves these days have become the hybrid, which <laughs> what we mean by that is that people wear more than one hat is the cliche. And um, uh, I think that's pretty much true for everybody. I don't know. I, I don't know many people, I should say, who have exactly one job uh, from nine to five, Monday through Friday, and uh, in, in the modern world here. And and speaking of that, let's take a look at this. So folks that are interested in hybrid architecture, hybrid work environment, almost everybody, right? Because that's pretty, pretty much where we are. Um, and then whether it's working or not, sort of works, works pretty well. Some One person says it works great. We appreciate that. So um, when we, we're talking about this, a lot of things wind up wrapping around IT. So, so it gets funneled into this, enterprise architecture which revolves somewhat around it but that's not just the it's not just it right that's true you know in the most traditional sense enterprise architecture re refers to the or enterprise structure itself mm -hmm. too not just the technology that supports it but the behavior and you know what's the, in the commercial world we talk about the value proposition but in any case it's really the purpose what are we what are we spending taxpayer money for and what are, what what benefit is the is the uh, agency providing to you to other agencies or directly to the public and so on. Uh, but for this discussion, we'll focus on the application of digital technologies as key enablers of, of mm -hmm. your agency and service of the con uh, its constituents. And to go even a little further, adaptive enterprise architecture recognizes the need for continuous improvement. Things are changing all the time. There's always more demand for, for better, faster service and the uh, uh, every, everything is uh, the only constant is change. Right? The environment and the requirements are are changing, and sometimes they're brand new. Oh, I never thought anybody would ask for that. That leads us to some federal initiatives that have coming down the pipe, um, and cloud obviously was a big a big deal. Um, 
10, 12 years ago when they were putting that out. Tell us, tell us about, tell us about what you're thinking about that. Yeah, so 12 years ago, the, the, there was the uh, Federal Cloud Computing Strategy was published in, in 2011. And uh, at that time, cloud computing was not not so widely adopted as it is today. It was kind of a brand new thing. Everybody was afraid of it from a security point of view. <laughs> they still are. They still are, yes. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> yeah, some of that's just sort of a hangover and, and because it's... Uh, it can be made very, very secure these days. <clears throat> but in 2011, there was a, a significant problem to solve, which was low asset utilization and fragmented demand for resources, lots of duplication, and just things that were hard to manage and difficult to procure. And, and uh, the cloud was seen as part of the solution to uh, getting overcoming that. And so in 2011, cloud computing was seen as a having great potential to deliver public value faster, uh, more efficiently. Uh, eight years on, the next major policy document, uh, if you want to call it that, was called Cloud Smart, came out in 2019. And by this time, uh, a lot of people had more experience with the cloud, but there's still lots of room to address inefficiencies and improve service delivery. And some of the questions about the cloud became more focused. They came a little more clear. Uh, still, the, the procurement and long lead time was an issue. Uh, security, well, has, security has been the issue of the future, and it always will be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and of course, when you're talking about moving things out of an on-premises environment into the cloud, you have workforce considerations because a lot of things you do are the same in IT, whether you're doing it on an on-premises platform or in the cloud but there are significant skill sets to, to upskill the team with, to, to um, operate and maintain cloud solutions. It is working though, right? I mean, the agencies yeah. are, have adapted and adopted, but they're finding that some, some things, at least from cloud, from the cloud perspective, some things can't be put out to the cloud and shouldn't be, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, so, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that's... for example, I mean, just just a small, small example, uh, a physical security system uh, around a, um, you know, a secure facility of some kind, doesn't matter what agency it is, the, you, sh you shouldn't have your, your video recordings and your sensors for your gates and your doors and all the stuff that you use to manage that, that shouldn't be anywhere except on premises, should not, or in a you know, tightly controlled spot down the private network, it shouldn't be in the cloud. Have you? As one example. And now GSA does have some guidance on this now for, for where we're heading next, right? Yeah, it's interesting because in 2011 and in 2019, these were high level sort of government CIO, um, very broad computing strategies and, and directives. And now by 2021, GSA is putting out you know pretty specific guidance and, and and not to say that they're telling you what to do, but they're they're talking about the things you should consider, uh, things like cost effectiveness and manageability, performance and reliability, certainly security and privacy comes up all the time. And those IT workforce environments, uh, workforce requirements, uh, is your technical team um, properly skilled to support a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud environment? And by multi-cloud, what do we mean by, uh, I'll take a moment to define these. Hybrid cloud, we we mean that you have some of your some of your systems, some of your core systems are on premises in your uh, agency facilities, uh, and uh, as they as they should be, as they need to be, or it's because of where they always were. But there's some part of the solution, some part of the whole IT footprint for your agency that is suitable for the cloud that sits over there. So some of your your IT work is done on premises, some is in the cloud, and that's what we call hybrid cloud. And, and of course, there's there are trade-offs there. There's price differences. There's reasons to be in the cloud. There's reasons to stay on premises. And a lot of times, you got to figure out how to move data back and forth. And, and multi-cloud. If I can just pause on that one just for a second. Okay. Multi-cloud is maybe you've got some things in uh, in the Azure uh, Fed Ramp space and some other or in the AWS uh, Fed Ramp space and. And that's what we mean by multi-cloud. 
Some, and you can have hybrid cloud, multi-cloud at the same time. You can have uh, part of your solution on-premises, part of it at Azure, in Azure, part of it in AWS, maybe some, you know, somewhere else. Yeah, and it's no different than what you would normally have. You you had different systems even in, in, in your house, right? Because mm -hmm. you're and, and there's no difference. And All right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've got I can't say their names out too loud because they'll start answering me, but there's you know, there's Google Nest here and there's <laughs> Alexa down the hall. And okay, so so far nobody's answered me yet. But yeah. <laughs> and and what's important to know is that not there isn't a one size fits all. There's no one solution for to complete it. And yeah, um, I, yeah, and that's exactly what the GSA cloud architecture guidance was about. They were saying, well, here's some good things to keep in mind. Here's some design patterns or some frameworks that make sense to use, but they're not telling the agency what to do. They say there is no one size fits all. And mm -hmm. that's why this the whole idea of enterprise architecture is something that you can uh, teach or explain in a in a set in a you know in a one hour webinar is uh, is challenging because there is it, it's about finding the the solutions the high level solutions that do fit your particular environment your particular agency and it's always different the answer is always different the architect comes the architecture the the art and science comes in and knowing what what the key considerations are and the and the frameworks and how to apply them. Oh. And right here on the, uh, this is from 2023. So we've gone from 2011 to 2023. And uh, in 2011, a lot of talk about the cloud and they're still talking about the cloud. But if you look at the federal CIO's priorities uh, in 2023, cloud is one of five. Uh, and uh, still a priority to drive adoption of cloud services where they're secure and appropriate. Still an issue of recruiting and fostering federal IT talent to support the solution wherever it is. And everybody talks about data today. If you don't have data, you can't have AI. And if you don't have data, you can't, without data, you don't have information. Without information, you can't make decisions. Uh, TBM, technology business management. A couple of slides ago, there was some talk about uh, duplicate systems and redundancy and unnecessary redundancy. And that's Still a thing to guard against that we don't have five solutions for the same problem. And that's a little bit what technology business management is about. It's the, it's the managing the business of IT for the, in the federal space, making sure that we're spending the money wisely. We're not spending the, the same, uh, not spending a dollar on the same solution twice and so on. And reading from uh, right to left, <laughs> uh, cybersecurity, of course, protecting our federal networks and information from the bad actors and not just the bad actors, but just from the, the fat fingers of um, anybody who's got their, their hands on the system from one day to the next. And it's, it, it, there was a, uh, one of my bosses, a CIO uh, one time told me, uh, it pointed out that the, the thing that kept him awake at night wasn't um, external bad actors. It was people just pressing the wrong button because they hadn't had their coffee. <laughs> <laughs> or just pressing the wrong button because they're people and we all make mistakes, right? Exactly. So, yeah. so, yeah. so cybersecurity is partly about keeping the bad actors out, but it's also about re uh, resilience and making sure that uh, when something does ha happen, even if it's not a bad actor, that we're able to uh, rebound and keep moving. It's funny that you mentioned that. Some of that is a combination of two, right? So I, I was um, years ago was, uh, down at the uh, Department of Transportation and two speakers didn't show up, so I pinch hit. I just said, "Hey, if you're crazy enough to put me up there, I'll I'll get up there." And I had a bunch of CISOs and CIOs in the room. And I said, "What's the biggest issue you got?" And they talked about fishing, right? So it's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. You have bad mm -hmm. actors wanting to do things, and then you have people that, "Hey, it looks real," and that one click, right, gets you in trouble. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. It's and not going to go away either. And internally at Divine, we have cybersecurity training for every employee every month. And you've got you to gotta keep people on their toes for those phishing attacks and all those other things where they're trying to get you to click a bad link or enter your you know, your credentials on a fake site. You know, you know, you know. The name of the game there. It's, 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 so I'm gonna pop this. I'm gonna pop up this. This uh, here. What was your agency struggling with? Is it technology, information, the organization? Like you said, Doug, it isn't just IT, right? We're gonna get into the next the next phase, and a lot of folks, 
the hybrid work environment is still a challenge, even though we've all been sort of working through that for the past three years. I don't know. There's this thing called COVID. Have you heard of that, Doug? I never heard of it. Uh, I, not only have I heard of it, I've, <laughs> I've, I've had all the shots and I still got the <laughs> thing. I still got the doggone bug. <laughs> a couple of times. Fortunately, right. it wasn't, wasn't severe. So as, as folks are working on this, hybrid everything, maybe, maybe not, right? Yeah. That's, but that is the general trend is hybrid everything. And there's, yeah. there's always good exceptions. I mean, like, yeah. Even like we talked about the exceptions of, uh, of cloud technology versus on-premises, there's good reasons not to do some things. And, oh, and boy. We'll come to those, those counterpoints later on. Yeah. <clears throat> but in all this, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but uh, I know we've got these enduring imperatives, whether we're looking at it from the lens of 2011, when they're just starting to put together a cloud strategy, or 2023, when we're trying to figure out how to do the best with what we have where we are today. We've got to deliver mm -hmm. public value and improve operational efficiency and respond faster. You better believe it. And the idea of hybrid everything, it, it materializes, if I can use that fancy word, materializes the idea that one size doesn't fit all. So in other words, we all know that we've, we've decided that one size doesn't fit all. And one, and one of the reasons, or one of the ways to respond to that is, you know, one part, uh, something from column A and something column B, you put them together and you, you solve the, you create the unique solution for your requirements. And, but it also becomes a preference. Um, once, once you see th how well hybrid things can work, it becomes a preference and a way of doing business, not just something that's just driven by uh, practical necessities. It becomes an architectural preference, if you will. Mm -hmm. And some of it's technology and some of it you mentioned before, is there's different roles that then yeah. things start to shift within organizations to be able to manage it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, for those who will... Uh, are interested in the slide deck and download it later. There's uh, some several slides about some of these things that are summarized here. But uh, hybrid information technology is what we talk about a lot in this context. Uh, you know, like the, the cloud, the hybrid cloud example is the most obvious one. Uh, but there, it, typically, you're talking about things where you've got disparate technologies. One that looks like an animal, looks like a duck, and one that looks like a horse, which you Put the <laughs> put the this is a bad analogy, but you put the horse, <laughs> horse and the duck together on the job it's a and get it done. <laughs> it's a huck or a yeah, doors. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um doors. and hybrid, <clears throat> hybrid roles, you know, this is uh uh traditionally and and this this <clears throat> traditionally probably means 20, 30 years ago, because I think uh in, at least certainly within uh, the last generation or so the the very narrowly focused role uh, has become more, more and more rare. Mm -hmm. People have to do one thing in the morning and something else in the afternoon, or every 15 minutes, they might have to change hats. Uh, but what that means for uh, information technology is a very, a very basic level. Sometimes you've got somebody who has, has to have access to multiple systems. So how do you secure that? Where this one person has to, may have to have elevated access in more than one place because they have more than one role. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or how do you enable them to do their job uh, in multiple systems at the same time? And can you go back, go back Dave? I want to spend just a couple minutes, on, not, yep. not even a couple minutes, just a few more minutes on this. Uh, hybrid teams, I think is a, I, I'm intrigued by the question about fusion teams. Um, I think we're mostly talking about the same thing. Uh, we're talking about teams that uh, are formed out of different agencies or different departments within the agency uh, that can develop a, a more holistic and nuanced point of view about the problem, then you can get in siloed teams. A hybrid work environment, somebody had a question about that. And all sorts of interesting organizational behavior questions come out of hybrid work environments. There's performance management uh, things. There's how do you develop and maintain a, an organizational culture when people aren't coming to the office every day? Because as we know, culture is created and sustained through conversation. And we can have great conversations by Zoom and, and Teams and all that. But the real conversations come when we're sitting across the table in the lunchroom and you're having your peanut butter and jelly and I'm having my tamale 
and we're just talking honestly about the challenges that we have uh, here at work. Here we and hybrid processes, uh, this is uh, a little harder to explain, but this is uh, <clears throat> things where uh, an end to end uh, organ agency business process where it's not uh, carried out entirely by one team or one organization where information is being shared and, and it's vital to the completion of this process, but it's coming from somewhere else in the middle of the process or in the end, or there's different disparate consumers of the results. And, and that's what we mean by hybrid processes. All right, so a little, little bit more deep, of a deeper dive here on the technology side, as we've said before. This commonly means that some of our stuff is on premises and some of it's in the cloud, and they can be legacy uh, solutions on premises or things that just don't belong in the cloud for security reasons or uh, operational reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> but in the hybrid world, you might be talking about the cloud, also the cloud native solutions that, that is, things that were built for the cloud, and they can be private or they can be software as a service. And, and software as a service has different implications for, especially for sensitive information. You don't want to necessarily be on those multi-tenant arrangements uh, where numerous organizations, public or private, are really using the same service and potentially subject to each other's accidents. <clears throat> and there are some things that are hybrid native, things that are, there's technologies that are emerging that are built for the hybrid solution. And in the past, the hybrid solution was, well, this was all built for the on-premises and this thing over here was all built for the cloud and so we'll somehow make them work together. But these days, technology vendors have recognized that the hybrid solutions are, are real and they're permanent. And so they, they build things that, that help you manage the whole mesh, all the moving parts. <clears throat> We're seeing more and more hybrid information Processing and here's a reference to AI. Somebody asked about AI. Uh, in the past, you write a program, you had a business rule, you turned it into a an algorithm, and you ask you answered questions that were predetermined, and and you, and you had a simple rule rule based way of getting the answer. Now with AI ML, you, uh, uh, machines are getting more and more able to identify patterns and and to identify exceptions and even suggesting new questions. And the hybrid information processing model is a combination of both. There are some questions you're always going to know. You're always going to know. Uh, you're always going to want to ask, like, how much do I, how much do I have to to pay this month? How, what's my payroll this month? Those are very deterministic questions. But you might be using the same data in an AI ML solution to predict. Uh, when are we going to have a peak of? of uh, vacation requests next year based on past behavior. And that's a, kind of a silly example, but uh, more and more we're seeing artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions dropped into traditional data processing right. uh, uh, ecosystems to solve specific problems and to make, make things uh, um, a little more transparent, if you will. And hybrid devices, just a, a mention of uh, technologies here. We talk about the internet of things. The, the world around us is all, is the world is analog, but to make sense of it in a digital percent, uh, perspective, we have to uh, translate that and we use these internet of things devices. So those, all, every IOT device, pretty much by definition is a hybrid device. It's some way of perceiving the real analog world and turning it into digital information. And IOT means what? The Internet of Things. Internet of Things. Just making yeah. sure we don't drop any out, uh, unnecessary. Or yeah, yeah. So a simple example is yeah. uh, a security system is door sensors. And it could oh be your, your secure federal agency facility or it could be, a, like, it could be the Simply Safe devices here on my windows and doors and in, in the house here. Oh, you can do toasters and refrigerators and everything. Everything's connected yeah. to the internet. Yeah. Well, everything's yeah. wireless. Don't know why you need all that mm -hmm. stuff, but I'm sure somebody will make sense of it someday. Well, here's here's why you need it. I got <laughs> off a plane in Dublin, Ireland one morning, one Sunday morning, and I opened my, my app on my phone, and I realized I'd left the garage door open all night, and I was able to close the garage door from Ireland. Well, that that is an accomplishment of accomplishments, Doug. 
That's a that's but that's the Internet <laughs> of Things. That's what we're. That talking. is exactly right. Wouldn't be able to do that in the nineteen fifties. I could tell you that. Yep, and uh, another silly example. I was in, in India a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I, I learned that my wife had gone grocery shopping. So come sometimes when you're grocery shopping, it takes a while to put everything away, and you tend to leave the door open on the refrigerator. So and I it was, told you in India? It told me in India that the refrigerator door had been open for more than five minutes. Now, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you know how connected Doug is. Mm -hmm. So there That's you go. pretty That's connected, Doug. And I'll tell you, it's funny, the story that you were mentioning about all of our little home devices, because, yeah, you can't even use the word Alexa, Amazon, Google, anything anymore. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really bad when there's a commercial for exactly. it. Exactly. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be you. It can be this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, now, heterogeneous, man, that's a big word. Yep, yep. Heterogeneous, heterogeneous, however you want to pronounce this. You can, you can put the you can put the emphasis on several different syllables there. Um, but, uh, hybrid and heterogeneous are not exactly the same thing. They're kind of related terms, but so far in hybrid, we've been talking about using different similar uh, dissimilar parts in concert to perform different functions, but all together to to enable an entire process. So the, the individual parts are doing different things. In a heterogeneous architecture, we may have dissimilar parts doing exactly the same thing. We talked about multi-cloud before. You might have a, part of your solution is on AWS and part of it is on, on Azure, part of it's um, on-premises. And it might be all, all three of those capable of doing exactly the same thing. And, and here's why people do that. It's especially important in mission critical applications, whether it's defense or homeland security, something like that, when you have a heterogeneous footprint like that, heterogeneous meaning that you've got, again, multiple uh, solutions for the same problem, but they're all a little different. They become much more difficult to attack in a mm -hmm. cyber attack because most cyber attacks are specifically designed for one particular technology. So if you've got everything in one technology, and you can have the greatest backups in the world, the greatest recovery plan. You're still going to be down while you're restoring things. But in a heterogeneous solution with, and this is this is the difference between redundancy and resilience. I agree. A heterogeneous solution can create resilience, where if one of those three solutions is attacked, it can go offline. The other two will stay up, and they're not vulnerable to the same attack. So, and they are more expensive to operate because now you've got three sets of the same thing and you're paying three vendors for you know, an entire solution. But, you know, if it's a defense application, a homeland security application, it's mission critical, you can't afford to be offline for seconds or minutes sometimes. Yeah. You've got it. Yeah, and that's so. The, uh, you know, the bad actors aren't just always trying to steal our social security numbers. We have to worry about the bad actors who are just trying to cripple us operationally. That's that's fact, too. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about agency challenge. I'm going to share this out with you. This is what we talked about before. Um, a lot of different reasons for, for challenges, right? So, uh, so give us an idea what what your take is on on some of the ones you've heard from from agencies. Well, you know, if I think about everything that an agency has to do, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. And in some ways, I'm glad I'm on the outside looking in, or at least on the outside being willing to help. Uh, obviously, you've got a specific agency mission. And you need to deliver that to the public with excellence and responding ever faster to continuant, uh, constituent needs. As, as federal agencies, you've got not only uh, laws and regulations and policies, but you've got all your internal uh, Procedures, you've got the GSA looking over your shoulder. You've got to follow the, the guidelines and the CIO priorities. And all this while adapting to changes in the political and social and economic environment. I'm sure. Changes in political, social? No, no changes. <laughs> yeah, like hourly. And um, But the good news is, while you have to adapt, you can adopt these new technologies to help you go yeah. farther and faster and cheaper. And of course, adopt isn't, it's that's the only one word, but you've got to have that workforce. And you can't just 
buy it tomorrow because you've got a lot of sunk investment, prior investments. You've got to ma maximize the value of that before you just turn it off and buy something new. <clears throat> All the while maintaining security and improving security and countering cyber threats and trying to be smarter than the bad guy and do it all on time, on budget, and sometimes a schedule that's too short and a budget that's too small. Everybody here, nobody has a problem with the budget or the timelines. Nobody here has that. Well, if nobody <laughs> had that, you wouldn't need good project managers. That's you exactly right. To manage scope, yeah. schedule, and resources. I don't think I've ever gone into an agency. I just have unlimited budget to solve this problem. Never heard that. I don't yeah. think so. All right. Yeah. But so, the, it, to your point, it, the the direction doesn't change. We've got to we got to mm -hmm. have the deliverables, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So I keep pounding away on this here. Yeah. Deliver public value. So what does that what does that look like in in the real world here? And how do you how do you respond to the, all this this dynamic environment? And and in my opinion, uh, responding to an, a dynamic environment requires internal adaptability. So outside the circle, you've got the external environment, very little which any of us can control, and we've got inside the circle the things that uh, we can at least touch, even if we can't control them. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, we can we have a greater degree of control over these things, and um, so this dynamic organization, this dynamic agency, is a bit of a theoretical ideal. But it's this is it's just a way of thinking about how to be quick on your feet and adaptable. Uh, uh, yeah, in, re in response to an externally changing environment, a, a fast changing world, it's an aspiration. It's not, it's never fully achieved because, never. you know, you, you want to be fast on your feet, but sometimes, you know, it takes three years to get the, get, get that procurement done or, or build that new system. And, uh, but there are lessons to be learned from these things are instructional for everyone, but four common traits about adaptable organizations is that they're, they're a learning organization. That is, they take time to do uh, post, post mission briefing, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm debriefs, lessons learned. They're disciplined. They've got repeatable processes and, and they, they you know, try not to reinvent the wheel when they've got a, a proven way of doing things, which is a little bit of a contradiction with what I just said about learning, but it means <laughs> you, 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 you learn together and you decide to change the discipline together. Whatever your, whatever your process is that you're following with great discipline, you keep doing that until you learn different. Yep. Love that. Yeah. And you're trans and I think you're, you're transparent both internally and externally, and you're connected both internally and externally. Yep. And adaptability being it, I, I couldn't agree more. And sometimes there's some folks that have been maybe in your organization, not not necessarily not necessarily maybe not in your somebody else's organization might just have some holdovers and legacy that you have to pull kicking and screaming every once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do we achieve this uh, from an enterprise architecture point of view we, we can talk about the organizational aspects as we did a moment ago about being learning uh, learning organization and disciplined and transparent and connected to each other and connected to our constituents but to move the technology we have to think about how we can change that from an architecture point of view and uh the traditionally slow moving elements of the ecosystem, which are things like the, the massive data centers and, and big investments in uh, uh, custom or off the shelf software. Um, they, we've got to get to the point where some of these things are easier to change and replace or, or remove entirely. Mm -hmm. And part of the way to get there is to break down the monoliths. That is the things that the, the giant, uh, the things, the 500 pound gorillas, we got to get some, we got to get some smaller monkeys. <laughs> That's a terrible way to say it. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, the monolithic systems have to give away the integrated hybrids uh, of swappable components on low friction platforms. What do I mean by that? A low friction. Low friction platform means that's something where you can plug something in, it slides right in, or you can slide it right out. And uh, there's, Every time I look at, at the marketplace of applications and solutions, whether it's on Amazon or AWS, the list of swappable components is, is, is mind-boggling. There are solutions for everything. Mm. 
If you don't like the one you've got, you just you swap one in, swap one out. And that's just a very, that's just a very low level in, in inside of applications. But the same concept applies. There, things are much easier to change than they used to be. Just because they're not typically, even in the data center world, they're not they're not using the you know megawatts of uh, power like they used to. Some are, you know, some are, but certainly over at the uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they're use, doing massive computing, and, and NSA does massive computing. Those are hard to hard to swap out, but the everyday operational systems are um, much more lightweight, much more uh, um, less dependent on the heavy heavy infrastructure than it used to be. Yep, yep. Finally, the last point on this this slide here was about just the way we approach enterprise architecture. What we're seeing is that. Um, it, it used to be a really esoteric specialty where there was a guy in the corner and, or a guy or a gal in the corner or a group that did enterprise architecture and told everybody else how to build their stuff. And um, now that's giving way to a, a few people in the organization who are architect types who think about frameworks and guidelines and uh, overall patterns and, and, the, and keep, keep on top of the changes in technology. But the architecture itself as a practice is, is becoming more community-based within IT organizations. And we're, we're seeing that in uh, a couple of different places that we've worked. And innately adaptive technology. So as I mentioned a long time ago, there are things now that are built not only for specifically for the cloud, but they're built for multi-cloud. And cloud means a lot of things to different people. It can mean, uh, oh, let me take let me take a pause and take that question where it says community-based. Um, when I said community-based, I'm referring to enterprise architecture as a practice. And um, some people call it a center of excellence within an organization. Some people call it a community of practice. So rather than all the architecture decisions being top-down, I'm thinking of the uh, applications people and the data people and the infrastructure people, the security people forming a community to jointly make architectural decisions. Does that make sense, Tawana? I want to make sure that, there we go. Okay, there you go. Right, Doug. That's what I meant, yep. Yeah, I didn't mean like, you know, we're gonna have our, we're gonna have a town hall <laughs> with, <laughs> with, with, with the people. With the people uh, from you know who work at the Seven Eleven, ask them what they think. That's not what I meant by community. <laughs> you can if you want, if that's your deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. Great, question. Said no. <laughs> great question. Great question. Tawana said no. <laughs> yeah, great question. You know, I often mean these things. I I know exactly what I mean, and without questions, I, I have no way of knowing if, I, if I'm was being right. understood or not. So appreciate that's appreciate awesome. the question. Yeah. So. Um, Sure, innately adaptive uh, technologies. One of the things that's it's adaptive, I've talked a lot about things that can, you can plug and play, you can swap in, you can swap out, but just also just by nature on uh, whether any of the hosting hosting providers provide elastic computing, and there's a couple kinds here. Sometimes they call it horizontal and vertical scaling, uh, where um, in, in vertical scaling you have something and when demand is low it, it can shrink itself when demand is high it can get bigger and horizontal scaling though means you maybe you've got entire um, entire copies like for example in it we often have a production system and a development system and a test system and sometimes we need several test systems and the ability to rapidly deploy another test system and rapidly destroy it when we're done uh, it's not only efficient; it saves money, and it's, it's very it's convenient. And you can you can flex your platform according to your to their needs to your to your projects. If, if you, you might have a very stable platform, uh, that's where you, you know, all, but all of a sudden you've got a new project and you haven't changed anything for a long time. Well, now we need to have a test system. So you spin up a test system, do what you need to do, and tear it down. You only pay for it by the time you use it. That's an advantage of cloud technologies there. All right, so counterpoint. So I'm going to kind of contradict much of what I've said before. <laughs> uh, 
and I'm just going to I'm just going to clarify. I think maybe clarify rather than contradict. Uh, adaptivity is really for the digital technologies that are closest to the customer because that's where the where the requirements are changing. <clears throat> and um, I'm sorry, I got distracted by the question. Uh, yeah, right. so adapt adaptive. So think about a continuum here, where some things uh, you can really focus on adaptivity, but some part of the of the uh, infrastructure you're better off focusing on stability. So in your platform, like you don't want to be switching back and forth between I'm going to name names again, Amazon and AWS, AWS every every year because somebody lowered their prices by a tenth of one percent. You need stability in your technical foundations. <clears throat> but once you get a stable foundation built, then you focus on ad adaptivity for the technologies that are closest to the customer. So there are times when that whole monolithic thing is is actually a, the right way to go, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And in in the commercial world, you know, we think of things like the uh, the ERPs, S, SAP, or PeopleSoft, or whatever they are are these days, where you have one giant software suite that does all kinds of stuff. It does your payables, your receivables, your you know manages your your payroll and your supply chain, all that. And it's sometimes those are the best way to to do it, but not for mission critical systems. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. It I mean, could be. It depends. Be. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was. If uh, not sure, I understood the question. So, so um, let's see. Uh, yeah, Vernon, this is being recorded, um, and the handouts are. I'll hand. I'll make sure the handouts are popped in one more time, just in case you don't get it. And then uh, Tawana, let me see if I can get Tawana. Hold on a second, Tawana. Let me see if I can get to you. And just because you're asking all kinds of great questions. Can do you have a mic, Tawana? Hello. Hey, there she is. How you hey. doing, Tawana? Who are you with, first of all? I'm with HUD. You're with HUD. Fantastic. Appreciate what you do. Mm -hmm. And so what so uh, you're you're asking a question oh, about when he said that the back end should be have stability. I'm mm -hmm. thinking that the back end and not switching, we have both cloud environments and not switching the, um, based on cost, based on what he said on the cost, not switching that backwards and forwards, especially for mission critical systems. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking. Oh yeah, and I completely- um, so, so, I, if, I, so if it's a financial system, you want that stability there, but because we have people that for uh, external clients that come on the front side of it, mm -hmm. make that more adaptable for them, but not changing that back end. I'm just trying to get context to what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, that's a perfect that's a perfect way to say it, and that's exactly what I was what I was thinking about the, the balance between uh, stability and adaptability. You know, you've, got, you've got to have a, a solid foundation that you can build on and and change change the things on the front end in response to the changing requirements and the user needs yep yep okay awesome that's awesome Thank you. and so yeah and and you all you always find that you're you may have a different interface for outward facing and you mentioned customers that may not even be that may be internal customers in hud right it it could be both it could be both right and and get gain access to that. I think one of the most important things you you say, Doug, is hey, no matter what, one size doesn't fit all, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tawana. That was awesome. Thanks for being willing to pop open just like that. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Tawana. Nice to meet you. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You all as well. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. So uh, there isn't necessarily a better or worse. It's just different, right? Yeah. 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 Well. It's yeah, it's situation specific. It, mm -hmm. it might be better or worse in your situation, but it's certainly not <laughs> better, sure. better or worse for everybody. That's that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about what what's next. If you're if you're thinking about 
where you're headed, what what do you want to, what you guys want to do? What is that? What's the next for you, you're recommended for people? Yeah. Well, I just think you just need to think about hybridization as both uh, an external reality, like an environmental force. You know, you can't stop the wind. Mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, hybridization is like the wind or the rain. It's coming. And, and it's, if it's not already here and it rains on the on the prepared as well as it rains on the unprepared. So it's a force to be recognized and, and harnessed. And uh, you know, you can either put up a windmill or you can just go hide from the wind. And it's an opportunity to serve, I think it's an opportunity to serve the public with increased efficiency and responsiveness. No, no doubt. And and because it's it's going both ways, do you have time to jump into a case study or two? You think? Yeah, yeah, All I right. do. Yeah, I think we've got about five minutes. Yep, we can probably do it. Yeah. All right. Spend one or two minutes on each. Yeah. Yeah. A few, a few real life experiences. So here's uh, a, a real um, multi-year journey with one of our um, one of our engagements, where uh, in 2017 everything was on premises. The ap applications and the data it was all self-hosted in a rack of machines down the hall from the CIO's office. Yeah. And. Uh, all sorts of good reasons about why it got that way and all sorts of reasons why it wasn't good to keep it that way. That's exactly right. Yeah, a so lot of times with engagements, I say, you know, come on, come as you are, but we're not going to stay that way. That's right. Yeah. And it's iterative, right? It doesn't have to be, it's not a big bang. It doesn't have to go all at once. You, you, yep, you take yep. It. yep. Iterative or phased. Yeah, yeah. So you go, then you moved to a private cloud and then you that, moved. That was the next thing they did. They moved everything out of the, basically out of their home office into right. a, a private hosted situation somewhere. And the next thing was to improve performance. Some of the data was better off in the cloud, even though the applications were still in the private cloud. Some of mm -hmm. it was, there were some better solutions for large uh, data but to put it in the public cloud. And it did improve performance. And Finally, the applications are not quite there yet, but the applications will be moving to the public cloud as well. And I, I think this is right. It, get, being having it be iterative and planned out, and that that migration, right? Yeah, yeah. And some of our, you know, some of our work is uh, exactly that. We our our, our entire work might be have a multi year context, but we really do the whole thing in a few months and say, here's here's a way to approach this over the next two, three, four years. I think this applies to what Tawana was talking about because you had the financial systems mm -hmm. and, and working through this. Take us through this real quick. Yep, yeah, here's another one where the, uh, uh, there a, is a core application that does lots of things. It's uh, constituent engagement, if you will. It's operational uh, um, scheduling and some, some financial things, but the actual bookkeeping, the real financials, that's separate. And those are bolted together. There's a front end for the customer inquiries and customer messaging. And there's a supply chain piece for this particular application. And that's hybridized in a mm -hmm. different place that's, that's really best suited for that vendor integration uh, for messaging to and from all the people they're buying stuff from. So you go from, you have the websites, you have SaaS, you mentioned that earlier, mm -hmm. running in, in that piece. Yeah, have, yeah, exactly. So in this case, yeah. the financials are SaaS, the uh, mm -hmm. customer facing stuff is uh, all custom websites. Uh, messaging is a combination of email and uh, SMS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you got to deal with third parties, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, a particular case that whole the whole supply chain part is a third party solution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But best practice is no matter how you put it together with how whatever combination of internal and external components that your stakeholders see a consistent single solution. Yeah, I think that's where that's where we go. We and so we're gonna we're gonna stop it here. If there's there's some additional slides that you can download, I'll make sure I'll pop this in. Um, any any um last minute things that you guys would like to talk about. I want to just want to make sure we get to get you guys wrapped up and out of here. There's some references in, um, in, in that as well. So it'll talk a, 
it'll, it'll get you cooking. But I do want to make sure we get to this question, which is continuing the conversation. Is if you'd like to continue the conversation, we always love to continue the conversation. It doesn't have to happen right now. We can dive into something specific for what you need. Um, and at, by the same token, as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to buy from anybody. But if you'd like uh, to to talk to Divine about anything, they're GSA schedule holder, uh, 8A certified, right, Matt? And um, and and they, if you need to get to them through a partner, you guys have a bunch of different partners, right? You know how to make it work. If they need, if some, if an agency needs to work something, some magic, right? Absolutely, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and and we will make sure you get you that. And you will get a recap email uh, end of the day, early tomorrow, depending on on um, Zoom. <laughs> but we'll make sure you get the presentation links to the video. If you need a CE cert, let me know. We'll make sure you get your copy of that. And and you can chat with these guys whenever you want to. Any last minute things before we jump out of here to get you out on time? We'll make sure we get that to you. If you need anything specific, you can reach out to Matt. It's matt.sweet, right? With two yes, T's, sir. just messing with us. With uh, spelling, saying it wrong, spell, sweat. No, it's not sweat. It's sweet with two T's. <laughs> and you reach like out to What's that? That's, it's sweet tea. It's sweet tea. Sweet tea. Oh, that's. Is that the first time you ever heard that, Matt? No. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, man, that's the first time I've ever heard it. <laughs> that's fantastic. It's like people saying, how low can you go, Dave? Because I'm Dave Low. So, anyhow. <laughs> so, uh, there you go. I appreciate everybody's time. I appreciate Tawana's question, but I also appreciate just the ability to just talk about some of this stuff out loud because just the process of hearing my own voice say something. Yeah, you know, something that, something that I learned today from. So I hope I learned I learned something today just by saying it all out loud, and I hope everybody else did too. I hope so too, man. We really appreciate. It. Great job, Doug. Appreciate you, man. If you need to reach out to to Matt, you can do that. And um, if you have any additional questions, you can certainly do that. We'll get you guys out of here. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate all you guys, especially as we get uh, wrapping stuff up for fiscal year end. We know that could be a, a headache for you all, so we appreciate you guys. Uh, doing everything that you do, HUD and, and the rest of the organizations that are here. Appreciate y'all. Thanks Thank much. You. And and uh, and I will, we'll see you next time. What you got there, Matt? I said, thank you. That's all. I'm waiting. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> all right, guys. Bye. Thanks, Doug. See you guys.